happy to be here with you all. So yes, welcome to the Mind Walks Lecture Series hosted by California State Parks and the Central Coast State Parks Association. Uh, these programs are held every month and alternate between in-person and virtual. Uh, so let's see, next month, March, it, the presentation will be virtual and on Bobcats. And then in April, we'll be back here in person for a presentation about the reintroduction of um, native oysters in Royal Bay. So lots to learn about coming up. And let's see, you can find a list of upcoming programs as well as the archive of all the past recordings at that web address you see on the screen. And the Mindbox program is underwritten by the Thomas E. and Mary Catherine Elsrock Fund, and supported by the Central Coast State Parks Association. Today's program will last about an hour, and if you if you didn't notice when you walked in, there are restrooms just around the corner there, very handy. Feel free to come and go as, as you as you need to. And, and now I'm pleased to introduce Ski. So. Steve, you come on up here. Steve Schubert attended college at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and received a master's degree in field biology and a life sciences secondary teaching credential. He taught high school biology and earth sciences for several years, has taught natural history courses for Cuesta College community programs more than 25 years, and has worked as a naturalist instructor at a local residential outdoor school program a lot of you might be familiar with called Camp Key. Steve authored a book entitled The Peregrine Falcons of Morro Rock, A 50-Year History, is past president of the Morro Coast Audubon Society, and is the volunteer coordinator of the High Mountain Lookout Project, and has been a speaker and field trip leader for the Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival each year since its inception more than 25 years ago. I'm getting so. older. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and wiser, did you hear that? I hope so. We might find out today whether that's true or not. Oh, goodness. Okay, here you go. Thank you all for being here. I am apparently the guinea pig for the first in-person meeting in seven years. So I want to thank you all for just being here. If I'm not speaking loud, please ask me to speak up. Uh, I can hear a little bit of traffic outside. But are you all, all okay with the volume right now? So I won't use a microphone. I'm going to talk really quickly and go through quite a few photos, but my goal is to introduce you to some overview of the biology or natural history of birds of prey, but this could be a, like an all-semester series of lectures, to be honest. There's so many topics to cover, migration, food preferences, behavior, nesting. So I'll give you a little bit of that, but my emphasis today will be if I see this bird in a tree in my backyard, what am I looking at? So I'm kind of for a beginner level, some identification or field marks to kind of get you familiar with you what you might see locally. Are you all local county residents? Or do we have any someone came here from England just to hear this talk? <laughs> so I'll probably be talking about a lot of local locations that most of you hopefully are familiar with. So Part of this, I am giving this exact same talk this Saturday for Cuesta College Community Programs, and I, it just turned out coincidentally I gave it for this meeting as well, but um, it's a Zoom presentation, so if anybody wants a double dose of this, you can join in Saturday too. So with that, all birds of prey that are referred to as raptors share some morphological characteristics, a sharp hooked beak, which tears flesh. And they are carnivores, or meat eaters in general. Most are predators, they capture and kill their prey, but there are exceptions, as there usually is in biology. Some are scavengers, including bald eagles at times, or vultures. Sharp talons on the ends of their toes. And in fact, most raptors kill and capture their prey with their feet. If I found an injured red-tailed hawk, and there's a few of you in this room who have done this many times, like Pacific Wildlife Care, a, a raptor might actually, if you approach it too closely, flip up on its back and throw its feet at you. That's really what you watch out for, those sharp talons. Not so often are they going to bite you, as you better watch out for those feet. That's often what they capture their prey with. Amazing vision. Their visual acuity is several times better than humans, and often their eyes face mostly forward on the face. Think of an owl, for example, that's 
looking straight at you. They have amazing stereoscopic or overlapping vision that gives them great depth of field. Peregrine falcons, I believe, if I remember correctly, trained falcons can respond to a waving handkerchief one mile distance. Wow. So that's how far they can see their prey that they're chasing. So we're going to go over some major groups of raptors. Uh, raptor, I believe, is derived from Latin, which I believe translates to, if I remember right, it can mean to thieve or steal or to <laughs> capture. So they capture their prey. The beauties are the broad-winged soaring hawks. Our most familiar one locally is the red-tailed hawk. And they have broad wings that catch those uplifting warm thermals or the wind currents and give them very good soaring abilities. There are the woodland hawks called exhibitors in general. And locally our examples are coopers and sharp shin hawks. The harriers are slender winged hawks that somewhat look falconish. And I'll be talking about falcons in a moment. When I drove in today on Los Osos Valley Road, I passed a kite hovering right by Laguna Lake on my way into the today. And there are the fish hawks, or the ospreys. So now you know how the Seattle Seahawk football team got its name. It's named after the fish hawk, the osprey. And another group that you're all familiar with to some degree are the large raptors and huge peak, the eagles, locally golden and bald eagles, which I'll discuss. I have taken many of these photographs, but I tried to give photo credit to the much better pictures you're going to see today. This happens to be an eagle nest near Lopez Lake, so it's kind of nice to know we have a few pairs nesting in this area. Vultures are technically referred to as raptors, sharp foot beaks, although their feet tend to be relatively weak. And I'll get into this in a moment, that maybe they're not true birds of prey at all, but locally, Vultures and condors would be examples. The largest flying land bird in all of North America with an average wingspan of over nine feet. And they are in this area being released. But that's a whole other story. Then there's the night shift of the nocturnal birds of prey, the owls. Similar characteristics, sharp foot beak, sharp talons, are they true raptors? Are they closely related to the hawks and the eagles? But to be raptorial could be other birds of prey as well. A loggerhead shrike has a sharp hook beak and they're predators. They will in fact catch a lizard and impale it on a cactus spine. <laughs> and that's its other nickname, the butcher bird. So they are predators, you can argue they're raptorial, but they're not, that doesn't put them in the same taxonomic group as true raptors. So, Speaking of classification, we're going to go back to a little bit of high school biology. And I forgot to tell all of you, you are getting tested today at the end of this talk. Maybe your anxiety level just rose a little, so we'll test you at the very end. Can you remember the seven levels of classification, whether plant or animal or fungus? All life forms can be categorized into the seven levels. And in a minute, I'll show you why I think this is important. And then you'll probably forget everything I said. So the largest level kingdom, for example, the animal kingdom, can be broken into smaller subcategories. So within the animal kingdom, for example, and we're going to classify the peregrine falcon as an example, they're animals versus plants. We'll keep it simple. And then if you break down all the animals on the planet from worms and jellyfish to whales, there are phyla. And the phylum chordata, for example, includes me because I have a backbone, so it includes all the vertebrates. So we're talking about fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Break down the chordata family into different classes, and that's the aves, or all birds, over 10,000 species of birds. Okay, so now we're going to break down the birds into their groupings. Who are the falconiforms? They are the daytime or di diurnal groups of birds of prey, and that includes falcons, like the family Falconidae. What's the genus and species? That's together the binomial or taxonomic name for any individual living critter, so peregrine falcon, common name. But on this planet, there's only one species of peregrine falcon, so the genus species Falco peregrinus represents peregrines wherever they're found on this planet. 
And the reason this is important is there's only one recognized taxono binomial or taxonomic name, but peregrine falcons are also called the wandering falcon and the big-footed hawk, and what else? They're a um, duck hawk. So something can have many common names, and that could be confusing. If you are traveling in England versus the United States, there are different names sometimes for the same animal, but only one scientific name. Okay, so now your job for the test later is to remember those seven levels in order. <laughs> Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So I'm gonna give you some high school, a high school trick that I learned, or a mnemonic device, keep Pots clean or family gets sick. <laughs> and that's how you remember those seven levels in order. So maybe you'll remember that. Keep pots clean or family gets sick. So what's this have to do with raptors in general? This is how I traditionally learned how to classify raptors when I took ornithology at Cal Poly many years ago. And notice <laughs> of all the diurnal birds of prey that are categorized into different families. Okay, you don't have to remember those family names, but I want to show you how this is in recent years completely changing and why. So, in this new taxonomic scheme that's being proposed, oh, maybe falcons, can everyone see this laser pointer by the way? Well, maybe falcons are not that closely related to a hawk or an eagle. So they've been reclassified into their own unique order and they're more closely related to parrots, apparently. And this comes through recent biomolecular DNA studies and skeletal studies, sometimes even behaviors, but it's interesting that maybe falcons are more related to a parrot than they are to a true bird of prey. And then, if you look carefully, where did I go here? Let's go up to the New World vultures like condors and turkey vultures. The family names are staying pretty consistent recently, but some folks suggest, whoops, sorry, too many buttons, classifying the vultures in a completely different order. Maybe they are not true falconiforms. In fact, they might be sicaniforms. Those are storks. So New World vultures might be related to a crane or a stork more than a true bird of prey. Mm -hmm. Interesting, for example, kids, I guess it's okay to say this with kids in the room. Storks and condors and vultures urinate on their own feet. <laughs> it's like us sweating. It helps remove body heat and regulate body temperature. Well, that's a behavior characteristic they have in common besides at the DNA level. So interesting, maybe, maybe they're not true raptors to begin with. Oh, and earlier I said new world versus old world vultures. So a vulture feeding on a zebra carcass in Africa is regarded as a true raptor. They are not related closely to new world vultures, but they're still called vultures. It's interesting. So notice here, old world vultures are still regarded as true birds of prey. Interesting. And then there's the nocturnal shift. The owls, they're not even regarded as falconiforms. They're in a completely different order, notice. And there are two families today of living owls. And we won't go into too much detail. Owls, this barn owl, which was roosting at um, the Botanic Gardens a few years ago, notice that heart-shaped facial disc. Those feathers, they can actually reshape that to a degree, and they help funnel sound waves into their ears. So they have such an acute hearing that captive barn owls can be blindfolded and still capture a mouse running across the floor from hearing it. And their ears are actually asymmetrical on their head. So sound waves reach their brain at differences of microseconds. And that helps them pinpoint the exact direction of where that prey animal is by hearing alone. And as you know, they also have amazing eyesight as hunters at nighttime. So the facial rough gives them that heart-shaped face. Well, it turns out if I was giving this class at Cuesta College this weekend, and I am going Zoom right now because I still haven't gone back to in person yet, we would go on a field trip right on campus because barn owls like to roost during the day in palm trees. So I pointed that out in case you live near a row of palm trees. 
you have to look up in the fronds and you might get lucky and find one asleep during the daytime roost. So here we are on our virtual field trip. And uh, we always check out palm trees, see if we're lucky and find, find a barn out roosting, sleeping. Another way to find a raptor, though, without directly seeing the bird, is look for evidence such as all that whitewash <laughs> on, in this case, a moral rock. And that could be seagull droppings or seabird droppings, but that's raptor droppings. And notice there's a couple, there's a barn out, a couple barn owls roosting in this very poor photograph. So raptor biologists sometimes look for what's called whitewash. It looks like paint. And that, that's bird guano, but it gives you a suggestion you might find roosting Raptors. Another form of evidence is looking for pellets on the ground because raptors in their, is it their esophagus, Kara? Or? Sorry, what? I'll just leave the anatomy out of it this time. <laughs> <laughs> or Jerry can help me in this room. They actually cannot fully digest the bones, the fur, the feathers of their prey items, so they compact it into a pellet and cough it up like a cat regurgitates fur balls. So when you find pellets on the ground, and in this case you could see bones and skulls and jaws, that's an indication you may have found a raptor nest or a roost, roost site. There's a full skull of a rodent there in that particular pellet. Mm -hmm. School kids, I hope they still do this, but you need to sterilize these, can often dissect these in class, and the teachers teach them to put them back together and identify what the critter is that the owl ate. Did you? It's often an elementary school party. So one of our most common owls in this area, you might be familiar with, that hoots a lot this time of the year is the great horned owl because they have these tufted feathers on their head that actually helps them blend in better with their background like the bark of a tree. So that's cryptic coloration blending in. A uh, very common owl in this area, one of our largest, and it's also called the tiger of the woods. And these are ferocious predators. With a very poor sense of smell, they also are known to attack and eat skunks. So maybe your house cat if it's running loose in the backyard at night. So watch out for great horned owls. They can, quite large prey. And also, even though they might seem friendly and somewhat approachable, don't enter an owl nest during owl season, nesting season. These great horned owls can impale their talons in your skull. They will aggressively defend their nest sites. So most owls don't actually build their own nest. This, this nest was actually at a painted rock in the Creso Plain, and it's this owl is nesting in an old raven nest, or maybe even a hawk nest. So they might take over an empty nest site in the future nest there. But most owls do not construct a nest. Again, look how well it blends in even with the sandstone background to it. If you weren't looking for it, you might not notice it. Here's an owl. You can look carefully and see the ear tufts in the tree nest. And then the young, when they leave the nest, that's generally called fledging when they learn to fly. But most owls, before they fly, they just leave the nest and start climbing around. And that's called branching. So these youngsters are recently out of the nest. Maybe they can't fly yet, so they've branched because they're out exploring and flapping their wings and all that. But they may not have actually taken their first flight. Oh, that last picture was taken near the Mojave Desert. This picture that I took is in Montana Dero State Park of a flood, recent flood, and look at the, the downy feathers on its head. So that's a youngster there. Something that resembles a great horned owl and less common in our area is the long-eared owl. Look at those two tufts again, but they're much slender, and they tend to be in much more inland, drier, and even desert-like habitat. This is juniper trees above the Creso Plain, where I found them nesting one year. This is for Dave and Linda. This was on a CNPS field trip. And we went exploring and found the owls while we were looking for wildflowers. <laughs> Another fairly uncommon, well, that's a long-eared owl juvenile, so just some photos to go through. Another possible sighting, especially here in the winter, is the sawwed owl, little tiny owl, beautiful yellow eyes. 
Um, I believe there are nesting records in this county. This one was attempting to nest in a eucalyptus tree in Montana de Oro, and it brought the birders out from everywhere because that was an unusual nesting record. But they might be wintering in our area because they nest far to the north, as far north as the boreal forest. And here's an example of cavity nesting. So I have a seasonal home up in Washington State, and I took that photo in my own nest box just two summers ago when we poked his head out. I was thrilled to see that. A very uncommon and actually a federally endangered species in the north is the spotted owl. Have uh, any of you heard of this? The California spotted owl? Because it's made the news. It, it was a big controversy in, in the north where it conflicted with saving old growth forests that are heavily logged. And uh, if you live in uh, Oregon, Washington, or further north, it was a controversial decision to protect their habitat. Uh, this goes back a few decades. So, but it is, it is a species quite uncommon, but does occur in this area. There's some youngsters. Well, not all owls are strictly nocturnal. This is the burrowing owl that not only occupies burrows, like grouse burrows, that can be active sunrise, sunset, and even during the daytime. So somewhat diurnal in activity. And right now we have a very well-known burrowing owl wintering on Morro Rock. Now, as far as I know, we have no nesting along the immediate coast, but um, I don't know if it's still there, but it was there just a month ago. Birds are coming out to see it, hanging out at the rock. And there it is at its burrow. Another tiny owl, and that's how it got its name, is the pygmy owl. And this one was in my yard up north catching my bird feeder birds. But it was still exciting to watch. And when it turns its head, it looks like it's looking at you with false eye spots on the back of its head. So that could be a distraction or a way of avoiding its own predators um, because it appears like it's staring at you when it actually is not. These are false eye spots. Here's the one that captured a pinch at my bird feeders while I was standing watching it. So notice a tiny bird is catching prey almost its own size. In fact, it caught one of my morning doves, which was even bigger than itself, and it couldn't even carry it. It had to eat it on the site. There it is, feeding on a morning dove bigger than its own body mass. Okay, so much for the bloody photos. We'll move on. Okay, I knew that question might come up. Well, I'm going to need some help on this from the real raptor experts in the room, but they eat, they must eat almost every day because they will starve very quickly within, what, a matter of days? Kara, mm -hmm. how much did you feed your captive red tail hawk? Um, I fed her a large rat, like that big every day, or three small mice, a quail, small quail, every day. And then sometimes I fast her for a few days, just so, or like for two days, just to get her, I call that a crop, where they separate the bone from the hair, or feathers from the, the hair. And anyway, that, I would do that to kind of clean that out. And um, if her weight was good, she would separate. So yeah, every day. Jerry, you want to add anything to that? They can be emaciated within a matter of a couple of days. I think. They're not eating in three days. <laughs> Within three days, they're starving. And then when they're feeding young in the nest, the young have a voracious appetite, and they need to be fed multiple times every day to grow. Yes? So can they go out during a big rainstorm and eat the Well, I'm not going to say I'm an expert on all of this information. Um, I'm sure most raptors have to hunt in inclement weather. Some are grounded, though. Some don't. Condors can sit in a tree and kind of mope around for days until the rains and the winds stop and they wait for air currents. So some raptors will also gorge themselves on a really heavy meal when there aren't frequent feeding bouts. So just as a side, when condors gorge on a carcass and they're filling their crop and their digestive system, if they are frightened by a predator, including a human, they might vomit instantly to get rid of all that extra weight so they can get back up in the air and escape. So some can actually consume quite a bit of food in one meal. 
Okay. All right, well, this is the end about the owls, but notice that even though they're not classified as true falconiforms, there's been a flux in how they're being classified in recent years. And perhaps they're more related to a totally different group of birds called the frogmouths and the whippoorwills and whippoorwills and the, uh, oh, what do they call them? All the night jars. Interesting. So even though that's called converted convergent evolution where they share many features in common with raptors, maybe they're not true raptors. Who knows how this talk would be given in a few years from now with changes in opinions about their taxonomy. So the rest of my talk, I'm going to quickly focus on how to ID that raptor that you hopefully have an encounter with. And I'm going to heavily rely on this handout by Jim Lomax, who's presented at the Winter Bird Festival over 20 years ago. And I was so impressed by his talk that I asked him, can I please use your handouts for the talks I give? So I'm using his handouts to help me with a lot of these, these line drawings that I'm gonna quickly go through. Swainson's hawks do move through this county soon in migration, but they winter deep in the grasslands of Argentina. And now they're gonna be migrating north to their breeding grounds. We have a permanent breeding pop or resident population near the San Francisco Bay Delta. But this county does get some sightings as they move through all the way from South America on migration. But this is the hawk you all should expect to see regularly in this area. And it's North America's most common hawk or butio, a sewing hawk, the red tail. So what are some quick diagnostic marks to look for? Yes, they do tend to have a red tail, but not the juveniles. Their tail is brownish and banded, not bright red. Notice the leading edge of the wing here. This is called the patagium. It's just a web of skin here. And it tends to be dark when the red tail flies over your head. And then you look for the tail if it's an adult. This one's soaring in the wind along the Big Sur coast, but there's that orange, reddish, brick-colored tail of an adult. Not a great photo, but that's what you look for as a diagnostic field mark. This is something I made up for myself. When you see a big hawk sitting on a telephone pole or tree and you're going, what is it? When in doubt, it's probably a red-tailed hawk. <laughs> Secondly, I look for the following pattern. You tend to have a dark head, a light breast, and a bit of a belly band. It can be very distinct, very brown and dark. It can be very faint. So I look for dark, light, dark on their underparts. I just made that up for myself years ago and it tends to help a lot. Here's one at a nest with some downy chicks. There's the tail of the mother as she's departing the nest. Okay, there's, there's a brancher, but notice this juvenile who's just left the nest tail is not red, so in flight, it's over your head, you're looking, oh, I don't see the red tail. Well, it's maybe because it's age-related. Who needs to diagnostic of their age? It tends to be brown in their first year. And also, they have white windows in the wings, so the white, the sunlight shines through these panels, or white windows, that's somewhat diagnostic of juvenile red tail hawks. But when in doubt, Got a silhouette of a big, large, soaring hawk in this area. If I travel to South America, I'm going to be a lot more cautious of what I'm telling you. But here, when in doubt, it might be a red-tailed hawk. But another common beauty on this area is the red-shouldered hawk. And they truly do have red shoulders, but also this white crescent, which is mentioned here in the diagram. And often you'll find them in our area sitting on telephone power lines driving along Highway 1 to Morro Bay or Los Angeles Valley Road. And they're often associated with wetlands or riparian areas because they will feed on amphibians, including frogs. Um, so they like, but you never know. Here's one sitting on horse pasture. You can see him gazing intently, looking for prey. Red-shouldered hawk is another fairly common but smaller video in this area. Phrygianus hawk is the largest video of all of North America. This is a big hawk, but you only expect to see them here in the winter. So why? 
This is a migratory species that happens to nest further to the north on the ground in grasslands. So you might find this in the prairies of South Dakota or up into the Canadian prairies during the summer nesting season. But they do winter here in our area, especially the Creso plain. So Big Hawk has a very, very lightest colored tail compared to a red tail, fairly light colored head. Don't expect to see that in this area in the summertime, so seasonality is helpful when you're trying to identify a raptor. Here's one up in the Hearst, the Hearst pasture near Hearst Castle when they were wintering here. That's a dark phase for a genus. So sometimes you're open with field guy and go, I can't make things match up. But sometimes the same species comes in different forms or what's called morphs. So that's still a phrygenus, but it's called a dark morph. There's a more lighter, typical color, light morph. Hey, Steve? Yes. Um, can you clarify, if, if they're born with a certain morph, it's not like they, if they're born a dark morph, morph, they don't at some point morph into a light morph, right? No, I believe they're born morph. in the nest with their color phase. Okay. And you can have siblings that are different color phases, okay. potentially. I don't know too much about the genetics of all that. Uh -huh. But I'm sure there's some folks in the room who could help me out. All right, here's a more advanced field mark. Some of this just takes practice with time. But a, an adult phrygianus, the legs against the belly in flight make a V. So you see that V-shaped pattern on the belly? That's an adult phrygianus hop. That's one way advanced birders would distinguish it from a youngster. The rough-legged hawk is another winter visitor. This bird nests on the Arctic tundra, far north into Alaska and Canada. So they're wintering here. Again, the Creso Plain is, is great habitat for a lot of these hawks. But you would not expect it to be here much longer before they begin their northward migration. I suspect they're catching lemmings for their youngster in the summertime. Here they're probably feeding on ground squirrels in our area. So what are some diagnostic field marks? They have a dark belly band, very lightest overall. There's that belly band. This one was a rare sighting because we found it on the campus at Cuesta College. Um, and they have a relatively, relatively light colored head. So they're very distinguishable, but unexpected or not very common. This is one I photographed up north two winters ago where I live up north during the part of the year. So they're always exciting to find because you know where they came from, from the far north. All right, we're gonna start wrapping up our ID with falcons. Falcons are distinguishable with very long, narrow pointed wings and a fairly narrow tail. And most of them have a dark marking under the, on the face called the malar stripe or mustache. And it can be very prominent that mallard stripe or it can be very weak. But it's something they share in common. Peregrine falcon, the fastest bird on the planet, which dives through the air called a stoop, attaining speeds of over 200 miles per hour when it strikes its prey with its feet. And they are bird specialists. So that is a classic silhouette of a falcon. Narrow pointed wings, they're built for speed. I think I read this years ago, I don't remember when anymore, that experiments have been done flying a cardboard cutout of this silhouette over a chicken coop. If you fly it to the right, that looks like a long neck goose, and the chickens might ignore it. If you fly the silhouette to the left, it's a predator on the attack and they flee for their lives. So some birds can instinctually recognize a raptor in the silhouette instantly, what's on the attack. So very prominent mallard stripe, and falcons have this unique structure on the upper mandible called the tomiolar falcon teeth. Well, birds today don't have teeth. Their ancestors did, since birds may truly be dinosaurs. Ancient birds did have teeth. But anyway, that notch is unique to falcons, and if their prey that they strike with their feet has not been dispatched, and they strike birds in the air, the falcon will grab that prey and bite it and sever its spinal cord with that notch between the nerve, the nick vertebrae. So you don't usually notice that if you're not looking for it with your binoculars, for example, but it is unique to falcons, if I remember right. 
And I should have mentioned earlier that many birds of prey can be sexed when it's a mated pair because the female is about one third larger than the mate. This is not true for all species. You cannot sex a male and a female condor, for example, by just looking at them. But in many birds of prey, which one here would be the likely female? The one on the right, larger than her mate. Say that again. Good question. The, the, I will explain that a little better with a couple more pictures. Thanks for asking. Um, so, some falconry terminology. The male falcon is the tiercel or tiercel, and yes, you can sometimes sex them slightly different coloration because in the breeding season, the male, I'll have a better picture in a minute. I'm pointing the wrong way. The male tends a brighter, more intense yellowish around the eyelids and the sear and the feet. And that's characteristic of peregrines during the breeding season. The female is a little duller. Well, anyway, I wanted to show you again that to ID a raptor, you have to take into account what age is it. Because this is a juvenile peregrine falcon in its first year. I want you to notice, oh, this is a very old, old photograph, but um, this bird has vertical streaking and the eye color actually, the eyelids would actually be more bluish than this photograph, but this one's probably transitioning. The next photo is the exact same individual bird one year later in its adult plumage. That's an amazing change in plumage. So. How do you know the same bird? Well, this happens to be a very famous falcon. This is another long story, but I was hired as a falcon nest guard when I was still a Cal Poly graduate student, and this bird was stolen from its nest. This was way back in the 70s, maybe for the... This might involve... Gary, you might know the story as well as I do. Some say it involves CIA, CIA espionage to offer these birds to some Saudi Arabian sheik during the oil embargo. So this was a famous bird that was recaptured and brought back into captivity, and he became part of the captive breeding program. So I, the people who took this picture, they gave it to me. That is the same bird. So falcons, again, do not build a nest for example, out of sticks and twigs and grass. They occupy usually just a ledge or a cave and build out a little shallow scrape or depression. And that nest site is called the eyrie. This one happened to be photographed along the Point Bouchon Trail, for those who know the PG&E Trail. And to their credit, PG&E reroutes the trail away from this nest site during the nesting season. This is, this is the only nest site I could say I've discovered by myself while well, I was with a falcon and friend, but it was fun to say, I actually discovered this nest site. And that was a long time ago. But my connection, and many of you that are to this area might know that Moore Rock happens to be one of the most famous peregrine falcon nest sites on the entire continent. And people from all over the world who are tourists and visitors don't know what they're looking at until someone might point it out to you. But this is a place to come observe our nesting pairs. See the whitewash? So, in fact, we, these places have been given names for their favorite perches. This happens to be called the throne. So, that's when you know where to look, you kind of scan those places first because you never know where you're going to find them. So, I have my old photographs of a food exchange where the male is bringing in a prey item to give to the female to take the young to feed. So, it's called a food exchange. When he gives a, a distinct call, the female will barrel out of the nest and retrieve that prey beneath her mate in midair. And it's an amazing acrobatic feat. So there's a horrible photograph of a fruit exchange, which, which one's the female, the one below that's larger. She's taking that prey from her mate in her bill or her feet, and then she returns to feed the young. Well, that's a much better photograph. And Will Suter, who took this, these photos are actually on the book of a cover of a book, and he's been interviewed for National Geographic specials because he's such an amazing photographer. But to see a food exchange is always an amazing <coughs> acrobatic feat. So more rock. They are territorial, like many raptors. They will chase away large intruders, including humans, near their nest. Here are the here's a very well used eyrie of Moro Rock. I named that rock protrusion the diving board, so now we call it the diving board eyrie. 
And some of you might know the story that like bald eagles and brown pelicans, they were a declining species with broken eggshells, thin due to their exposure to DDT in the food chain. I'm trying to make this a shorter story. So for many years, this nest site was heavily managed where fragile eggs that might break were re removed for captive incubation. Young downy chicks that were hatched in captivity were returned and this climber is repelling into the eyrie. And these two little chicks were the very first peregrine falcon chicks fostered anywhere in the state of California in, at Morro Rock in the year 1977. They were actually hatched in Cornell University in New York and flown on a commercial flight just to be fostered into this site. So this shows you the time, investment, and money that was uh, instigated for many years to help recover an endangered species. These chicks were all always leg banded. I was fortunate to be invited to climb. I'm not a rope climber, but I helped carry gear. So I was able to climb a few times and see what a falcon sees from up above. Um, I've kind of tabulated some results. You can see over three, nearly three dozen youngsters were fostered into Moor Rock over the years. And then this program took place all over the whole country. And this is an example, like the bald eagle, the success story for the Endangered Species Act. They have been removed from the federal endangered species list. In the early 70s, there were only two known peregrine nests in the entire state of California. And now there's probably close to 300 or so nesting pairs. And it had to do a lot with this hands-on management program. So you can head out to our local rock and find the falcon observers. In fact, Bob Eisenberg here is now an official state park docent, and he is more than glad to let you look through his spotting scope. He's got a TV monitor in his truck where you can see the birds up close. He updates. He's got his own website, and he'll be glad to tell you what's going on, where are the birds, where are they nesting. So look for Bob. I need to probably wrap this up, don't I? How am I doing? Five minutes? Will that be? Okay. I knew I was going to be long-winded. <laughs> One of the nest, there are two nesting pairs of Moor Rock today, which is extraordinary. 20 years ago, everybody would say, how many pairs nest around? So there are only one pair that will never be more than one because they're too territorial. They attack everybody, drive the intruders away. Now there are two nesting <laughs> pairs at Moor Rock. We call them the south and the north side. And somehow they tolerate each other. Maybe they recognize each other because they won't attack each other unless they do get too close to the nest. So this particular female happens to have leg bands and she was banded at the Moss Landing Power Plant in Monterey Bay, and she fell out of the nest as a chick. And they banded her, and now she's nesting as the adult female at Moro Rock. Help, the banding helps you uh, learn a lot about their movements and where do they go and their dispersal. How, how long do they live? Again, I'm gonna need some help on this, but a, a bird over 10 years old is an old bird in captivity. I, I think up for, what, 18, 20 years would be a very old bird. Their tail's 30, is the oldest in captivity, and 26 is the oldest in the wild. It was banded as a juve, so it helps you get age. You can age in that way, too. <coughs> and so it was banded in Maryland, as a juvenile one-year-old, and it was caught in a leg hole trap that somebody had set illegally for coyotes. And so it was a, it was 26 years old and it was arthritic and losing its eyesight, so it, went, it was scavenging and it got caught in this leg hole trap. And somebody turned it in and they found out it was 26 years old. It's the oldest known in the wild. <laughs> but usually 10 years old and like, 70% uh, die in the first year of starvation. The mortality rate's really high the first one to three years with uh, bird prey. Generally, the larger the species, the longer the lifespan. So there is a California condor in the captivity, Topa Topa, who was brought in in 1967, mm -hmm. injured and never releasable, and he's still alive today, more than 50 years old, and part of the captive breeding program. So a lot of media attention over the years for our local famous nesting pair. Well, I decided to 
do my best and document the history of what happened there. So those who are interested, there's a 50-year history I authored, and you can find that at Amazon.com. I think the paperback copy is $15. If you decide you just can't get enough of the copies. <laughs> So we're going to finish with its close relative, the prairie falcon, more common inland in drier areas. They have dark armpits or axillaries. Can you see that? The actual photo. And occasionally we find them here on the coast, but they nest more inland areas. And little falcon chicks or raptor chicks in the nest are also called iases. Remember, I'm giving you all a test at the end of today if we have time. Those are the same chicks just two weeks later, showing you how quickly they feather out and grow before they fledge from the nest. A merlin is a small, uncommon falcon, and again, an exciting find. They are hunting over Morro Bay's marshlands this winter, but it's another species that nests in the far north into the boreal forest. So here we have another winter visitor, uncommon, and not expected here at other times of the year. However, the American kestrel, once called the sparrowhawk, is a year-round resident and the most common falcon on the continent. And what we often see driving by at highway speed, looking about the size of a robin, might be a falcon hunting from its perch, because they are found along roadsides quite frequently. Here's an example where you can sex the male and female by plumage. This isn't a male with the bright blue wings, uh, in general, females tend to have rusty wings. That's an example of how you can sex them if they're together. You see the mallard stripe below the eye. They're sometimes very distinct, and in this case quite thin, but still noticeable. A member of the falcon family are the caracaras. For example, when you travel the Gulf Coast of Texas or Mexico. But every once in a while, there are a couple records in this county car cars flying up from the north, from the south. Anyway, and then one of the last, I think I have two more groups to go. The woodland hawks are called exhibitors. Our two local species are sharpies, or sharpshin, and coopers. And the third species in North America is the goshawk. How do we do identify them? Well, even experts are advised to be very cautious and just call it an exhibitor. Sometimes it's, it's just darting through the sky, you get a brief look, don't even try to identify it to species. But if you have really good looks, the Cooper's Hawk has a more of a rounded tail in flight versus the squared off Sharpie. And then that crook in the wings of the shark shin give it a kind of appearance of a longer, generally it's said to appear to have kind of a longer neck that seems to protrude from the wings. But again, this takes practice, skill, sometimes just guesswork. So when in doubt, call it an exhibitor. But these guys are built for maneuvering. Short rounded wings and a long tail. They twist and turn among the foliage of trees and branches and brush, fearlessly chasing their prey, <coughs> maneuvering at high speeds. In fact, Cooper's hawks have been known to run after quail on the ground, <laughs> run them down. So these are fierce as a predator. In fact, the Cooper's hawk is the classic chicken hawk that raids chicken coops. It's often a coopers. So in flight, coopers, rounded wings, long tail, and look for the white under tail coverts. Kind of looks like from over, under, from their overhead, you look for the white underneath. Very poor photograph, but helpful for diagnostic field work. All right. Good. Budios tend to be the true hawks that are larger on the average with the broad wings. And I know I just said that for the coopers as well, but they're more short rounded wings. And Budios tend to have more of a short, what we call fan-shaped tail, but the occipiters have a more elongated, narrow tail. That's just a couple things that come to mind. So that's a Cooper's up close. You can age it because they have horizontal barrings on the underparts and bright blood red eyes. A juvenile, that's a pretty bad photograph, has yellow eyes and the, the underparts are vertically streaked. So again, plumage changes can help you sometimes age the birds. That's another juvenile that's recently left the nest. 
Anyway, seeing a Coopers is always exciting. They're not rare, but they're also uncommon. You don't see them on a daily basis. And when you do, they're often flying really fast and twisting and turning after the, as they go after their prey, including at your bird feeders, like mine. Did the name Coopers come from Chicken Coop or somebody Good question. Cooper? No, I think it was an ornithologist, somebody Cooper. I can't remember the first name. Thank you. It's a good question. Sharp shin means their tarsus, which is this, is really thin. So a sharpie does have really thin legs if you get a good look at it. That's a sharp shin. White tailed kite. They really do have a white tail and black carpals or wrist marks. I should have mentioned earlier that ospreys also have that. This was once called the black shoulder kite. Now they reverted back to white tail kites. And I saw this on my way to this talk this evening, hovering as they do, not all hawks can hover under their own wing beat. Kestrels do and kites. And it was doing exactly that by Laguna Lake on my way in. And they're hunting for meadow mice or voles. So they specialize on these mice. And bold populations can go up and down from year to year, and so do the kites. They kind of become nomadic. Some years they're common in an area, and some years they're hard to find. This is actually an imperiled species a few decades ago, but their populations were increasing. This was photographed near the Guna Lake. And they hover, but they also perch in colonies or roost together, often in colonies. You might find dozens as the sun begins to set up and introduce. Do you see a kite? Harriers, again, are slender winged hawks. With kids, I say they have a marshmallow butt. <laughs> they have a white rump patch, and they tend to fly low over marshlands and grasslands. And like an owl, they have a facial disc, and that means incredibly acute hearing. So they're flying low, they're listening, they're watching, then they quickly pounce on their prey immediately, just a few feet below them. Uh, um, like an owl, they have a facial disc. That is the silhouette of a harrier, once called the marsh hawk, and also you can see it's somewhat falconish in silhouette. There's one flying over the marshlands of the Lake. That's how they have it. Their old name was marsh hawk. Ospreys, the fish hawk. You see the dark carpal patches, which is actually the wrist of the wing. And from a distance, they're somewhat seagull-like, kind of black and whitish. Look for the black face mask. This one's perched on Coleman Drive out to Morro Rock. Years ago, just seeing a hospray fly by was exciting because they were in migration. Now we have a wintering population in Morro Bay of several birds, and maybe they're going to nest here in the future. This is at the Morro Bay Natural History Museum. So look on top of the ship mast where they might be feeding on a fish. This photo I took on Mono Lake at the Tufa Towers years ago, there are no fish in Mono Lake. So they actually forage on freshwater lakes in the Sierras and then return to this salty, briny Mono Lake to feed their young. But there are no fish to catch in Mono Lake. But recently, researchers have been banding ospreys at Mono Lake, and one was found in Morro Bay. So they migrated to the coast for the winter time. I think one of these birds was also found maybe in Baja, if I remember right. I don't remember, but anyway. All right, and finally, I promised you I was going to end this talk sooner or later. Let's end with the big guys, the eagles. In our area, two local species, golden and bald. Bald eagles truly do. Adults have a white head. I believe bald in England was another way of using the word white, like white-headed. And golden eagles truly do have golden hackles on the back of their head when it's distinguishable in flight. Golden eagles tend to fly like a turkey vulture with a very slight dihedral or V-shape. The bald eagle tends to be very flat wing like an airplane. But immatures can be challenging because they aren't always distinguishedly easily distinguished by white heads. So an immature bald eagle might even have a darkish head, but you look at the white modeling versus white windows and an immature eagle. Again, it takes some practice. That's an immature bald, uh, golden eagle. And definitely adult plumage bald eagles. But it takes them, what, four or five years to reach, go through these different stages of plumage. 
So I have a quick bald eagle story. This morning I was on my computer doing a practice Zoom session for my Saturday talk with my supervisor at Cuesta College, and I could see him looking out the window of his office and go, there's a bald eagle flying across campus and it's being chased by crows. And that happened this morning at Cuesta College. So they are in our area. Folks have been seeing a pair of bald eagles in Morro Bay most of this winter perching on the snags in the uh, salt marsh. They can build immense nests Year after year, the mated or monogamous pair might keep adding to the same nest, and some of these nests can weigh over a ton and actually break or destroy the tree they were built in. But um, some of them have such fidelity to their nest sites, they'll come back and keep building more onto it year after year. <laughs> Look at those feet. Their stronghold is still southeast Alaska. As many of you know, this was a highly endangered species like terror and falcons. Their numbers have recovered quite significantly in the lower 48 states, and that has also been removed from the endangered species list. It's time for me to wrap it up. Turkey vultures are often confused with what? Condors. <laughs> Eagles and condors. Oh, many yeah. folks see a vulture perched in the tree and say, oh, I saw a condor. <laughs> well, they are big, about a six foot wingspan, and they do have naked heads and necks like other scavenging vultures. Here they are scavenging on the sea lion carcass. Here's a red tailed hawk exhibiting dominance over the prey, and the vultures wait their turn to feed. They're, they're scavengers. That was filmed at Rancho Ochoa across from Cuesta College. So I think this is a display, called for Arctic display. They can display at their mates or maybe aggression, but also that's how they warm their bodies in the morning sun, absorbing heat. Condors fly flat-winged, so if you see a vulture a mile away, is it a vul turkey vulture or a condor? Condors fly like airplanes again. Turkey vultures wobble in the air in a V-shape or, or a dihedral pattern. I heard another speaker once say that that dihedral wobbly is actually aerodynamically efficient. Mm -hmm. And their tilting wings get a push mm -hmm. and push up the body and give them extra lift. I thought that was fascinating. That was the physics of flight. Anyway, so this was the last known nesting of a condor in San Luis Obispo County. This chick was photographed in 1969 and there was no nesting in this county until two or three years ago because now the captive birds are being released near our first castle in the San Simeon area, and they are now attempting to nest in the San Simeon area. So that, that's good news. After 50-some years, they might be nesting in our, literally, this is condor country in our own backyard. <coughs> all right, I knew I wasn't going to get to all of this. I hope I have time to give you your test. <laughs> have, any of you seen, have any of you seen a free-flying condor in this area? And you've noticed they have wing tags and sometimes mm -hmm. the transmitter. If you get a number off that tag and you record the color of the tag, you can report it. Mm -hmm. Citizen scientists mm -hmm. and go to the website. Um, forgetting the name of the website. Anyway, you will get feedback on the bird you identify. Mm -hmm. What sex is it? What age is it? Where was it released? And it's really, they really appreciate any condo sightings that you can report. I am a, one of the coordinators of our High Mountain Lookout project, and some of you might not know about this place, at this beautiful ancient fire lookout located above Pozo, up in the mountains. And we have restored it as a site to monitor condors with community volunteers like you and Cal Poly student interns that we hire in the summer. Can you get up there now? No, you cannot. In fact, the, the forest is actually probably still closed from the rains, but the road is too wet and muddy. And no, winter, winter wet roads, no. But we mostly operate spring through fall. And just wanted to, I won't go too far into this, but we have an annual open house event every October. Dave is one of our long-term volunteers. Caroline is a volunteer for this project. And we invite you to come up when we get back to in-person events. Because if you've never been there, you might have Dave Chipping and Linda. Have many, many, Dave is my geology professor from Cal Poly. And he'll give a geology talk to this event. But uh, I encourage you to look us up if 
this interests you if you've never visited this place. It has a 360 view that includes the ocean to the snow-covered Sierras, and it's located only a few miles from here. So normally I would say, okay, end of lecture, let's pile into the van and go on our field trip. And I just don't have time to do that with you today. Sorry, I did, I did go long-winded. But you are able to go on some guided field trips in the area. Lake San Antonio used to have a Eagle Watch tour, no longer operated, but I think this still goes on at Lopez Lake and Kachuma Lake near Santa Barbara, where they give wildlife tours, and that's where you can find wintering bald eagles on these, uh, these guided boat tours. Harmony Headland State Park, excellent place to see eagles, hawks, harriers, falcons. Uh, really highly recommend that. And go visit Morocos Audubon Society website. You'll find all kinds of information on where to go, what are the recent sightings. You can join a listserv and get updates. So normally I'd spend a few minutes with this, but I need to finish. <laughs> oh, ready? <laughs> Okay, test anxiety, pretend you have a piece of paper. This is going to take like two minutes, and then you get to grade yourself. One point in every correct answer. you got to pretend you're writing this down. Here we go. What are the seven levels? Oh, no, you can't say it. You're pretending I'm writing it. Okay, here's your clue. There's your clue. And you get all seven categories and levels. Level. Here is the answer. So give yourself one point or half a point if you got half of it right. Okay, question number two. Can you give an example of each of these silhouette raptors? One example of a falcon, an occipiter, an eagle, a hawk, or a beautia. Just think of one. You might probably, you probably think of one. Do you need a little more time? Okay, here's a few examples I talked about today. Can you read the answers? I don't know how well it stands out. Okay, give yourself one point for every one of those groups. So that's a five point question. Okay, ooh, juvenile occipiter, like a Cooper's hawk. Would it be vertically streaked or would it be horizontally barred? If it's a juvenile, here's the answer. Vertically. Oh, I forgot to ask the eye question. <laughs> Yellow versus red eyes. So that's two points. Oh, this is one of the harder questions. North America's largest soaring hawk. Only a winter visitor. And you get the spelling credit if you can spell it. Originus. Originus. Frigidus, I think, means rufous or rusty, and they have some, yeah, iron. Good, thank you. They have some rusty coloration. Okay, a little easier. This is one of the most common birds on the planet. Worldwide distribution except Antarctica. Okay. Easy one this time. Barnet. Ooh, tougher one. Maybe, but maybe not. So when you're not sure, call it an accipiter. <laughs> yes, you're right. It is a good question. Be cautious. It might be a shark. Shark. Fastest animal on the planet. Peregrine falcon. Oh, that's why it's called the big-footed hawk. Ooh, I should ask that question. <clears throat> used to be the black shoulder, now it's the white tail, right? I think we have two more questions. Ooh, flies low, facial disc like an owl. It used to be called the marsh hawk, or the harrier. Seagull in flight, but it's actually the fish hawk. Oh, too easy. <laughs> Bald Eagle, our national emblem. And I'm going to finish with the controversy that Benjamin Franklin was very displeased that our Congress des designated this a national bird. He 
because it eats dead things. It's a messy scavenger that eats carrion. He wanted the noble wild turkey. Condor, right? California condor. No? That's a culture. Okay, last question. Hardest question of all. What are you looking at? That's it. No way. <laughs> Turns out it's not a true albino because it actually had brown eyes. It didn't have pink eyes, which means no pigment. So it's called leucistic. It is a red-tailed hawk because when in doubt, it does have a little bit of rufus in the tail. But this bird was living for years by the Cold Canyon landfill off, what is that, Broad Street? And it was nesting with its mate, a typical plumaged red tail. And I would love to have seen the chicks in the nest because they were probably siblings of both colors. But this is a rarity because it lacked its normal pigment, but it's a red type hawk. You know, this was years ago. Gary, do you remember seeing this in yeah. recent years? Yep, I remember that. Really? Gary and I have spent some time watching this bird. It was, I, think it, I think it was hunting over the landfill and probably looked like a seagull coming in and maybe successfully catching prey if it wasn't. I don't know. That's my theory. But anyway, hi. Right, yeah. Um, you said that uh, bald eagle's nest can get up to, did you say a ton? How did, how? <laughs> well, I think the nesting cup is still the top of the nest, okay. but they just keep adding sticks to it year after year. And now, you know, some of these eagles are probably nesting a decade or more on this. They don't have to use the same nest. They can have several nests in that territory, but as the years go by, that nest just gets bulkier and bulkier. And the wind and the weight can actually break the branches or down the tree itself. <laughs> okay, finally, for those who just didn't get enough of my long-winded talk, I'm going to give this again this Saturday through Cuesta College Community Programs. If you have any contacts that might want to hear this, uh, it's like a $15 registration fee. And it's a Zoom lecture that gets recorded. So you can have the, the Zoom recording mailed to you if, if it interests you or if you know any folks who might. Yeah, I want to thank you all for your patience because I just gave you the really long version. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>